Hello and welcome to the RoboHub podcast. Today we will hear about a robot that is taking the stuff that we saw on science fiction programs of our childhoods and turning it into reality. At Endayadex, they are developing a pill-sized robot that you swallow, which will then live stream your digestive system for a doctor to view. This exciting new invention can help diagnose a range of diseases more easily, with an ambition to use the pill-sized robots for treatments in the future as well. Our interview Abate talks with Tori Smith about how this tool will transform medical procedures such as endoscopies. Welcome to the RoboHub podcast. Super excited to have you on here. So Tori, could you introduce yourself a little bit? Sure, absolutely. Well, you know, I originally I originally studied aerospace engineering because my goal was to build the the future of science fiction that I had read about as a kid. I had some relatives, you know, come down with some gnarly health conditions. I, I lost an aunt to a brain cancer and I became very passionate about the world of medical devices and maybe more importantly, just health and technology and how we can merge those, right? Because I, I think if you ask a 14 year old kid who reads science fiction, what they think the future of healthcare looks like, they would probably say, oh, it's going to be like nano robots that would go in like an army of tiny machines and kill any tumor, right? Um, and then if you ask a doctor, hey, I've got a glioblastoma, what's my prognosis? The doctor's going to say, well, we're going to cut an incision over here. We're going to peel your face down to your jaw. I'm going to cut out a piece of your skull and put it in a steel dish. Then I'm going to go in and do my best to remove some of this brain tumor. And we're going to put you back together. We're going to put you on drugs. You know, we'll put you on chemo. And you know, in six to nine months, you're you're going to be dead. So get your affairs in order, right? That's that. That's like the standard of care for glioblastoma. And my question is simple. The question is, what if, right? What if we could do brain surgery from a robotic platform? What if that robotic platform could be physically very small? You know, the way I envision it, maybe rice grain size. You know, I would love to go molecular level, but hey, I'm a knucklehead engineer. You know, I'm thinking in terms of objects that I, I can probably work on myself. So with the endiotics, our, our, our primary mission is to show the world that you can send tiny robots into the human body to do a job, any job. And we're going to start that journey humble, and we're going to start that journey where we can actually make something real. and. You know, let me show you what my version of tiny is, right? You know, that this is what I call Pillbot, and Pillbot is basically a little swimming robot that uses four little thrusters. We just use uh, the same motors you would find in a, a cell phone vibrator. We just take the weights off and put propellers on them. And the goal with Pillbot is just to create a moving eyeball in the human stomach. And from there, just see how small we can get it and see if we can put surgical tools on it. Right. But it's, you know, it's very important to have a tangible product in mind and believe me, like we started very humbly with this, with this adventure, right? You know, we just started building using raspberry Pi, right? You know, the basic electronic building blocks that just about any kid has access to that helped us to raise a little bit of money. And, and we started going to custom electronics and, you know, really stepping out into our own. You can see the JB Weld and BBs here, right? I didn't raise any money with it, but we kept pushing and we kept innovating and we got down to about the, the thumb size and, you know, we started to get more investment interest from the angel community at this point and doctors began to take a little bit more interest in us. And, you know, as of today, you know, I, I personally swallowed 14 of these robots. I haven't died yet. We, we will swallow them and drive them around our stomachs with Xbox controllers. And it's, it's actually a lot of fun. How long ago did this journey start? Uh, well, we incorporated in March of 2019 and the journey really began, I'd say close to like October of 2018 when, you know, I, if you ask me what I am now, I would humbly say like, I'm a, I'm a lowercase CEO, <laughs> right? We've incorporated a company, we've raised some money, we've, we've done some good with our robots. So we're very excited about it, but I'm, I'm a lowercase CEO. I'm, I'm a CEO who's hoping to do something big. But if you were to ask me who I was in October of 2018, I would have said I'm a depressed, aging senior R&D engineer who is exhausted with making other people's mediocre dreams come true. And the older I got, 
the more I just started to feel like the jaws of fate were closing on me, right? Like my opportunity to make some kind of a contribution in this world was starting to diminish. And then I saw this targeted ad on Facebook that said, practice pitch your idea for free at the Founder Institute. And so I, I really felt like, you know what, even if I'm ashamed of how old I am or ashamed that I'm not a PhD, even if I'm afraid that people might judge me or tell me this idea is stupid, I really didn't have anything to lose. So I clicked on that ad, I went and I practiced pitch my company and I got slaughtered. <laughs> was this the first idea that you pitched? Yeah, yeah. This, this is a, this first company that uh, you know I, I would call myself a co-founder on. I've been an early employee in previous companies, which I was very proud of. But this is the first company that I named. Let's put it that way. But the Founder Institute was a, a pivotal experience in my life. It, it truly helped me to rip the Band-Aid off. It helped me to realize that even though I often feel crushed by imposter syndrome, that I didn't need to feel like I couldn't try to do something big. And I guess the thing that I'm, I'm really grateful for is that they showed me how to get my friends together and launch a company. And, you know, as of today, we, you know, we've, we've raised just over a million dollars and put 23 of these robots through our own bodies and, and actually have some of the best doctors in the world now working on this team. So very excited, but the journey began with actually, you know, the journey began with the, a notebook sketch. I, I can show it right here. This is, you know, this is. October 18th, 2018, and my friends and I started drawing robots and we were thinking corkscrews or creepy crawlies or tank treads or inchworms, you know, we were agnostic. We just wanted to, in any way possible, make this thing happen. You know, little, little legs that could move around, night and all meshes, who knows how you would do it, right? But one of our sketches was submarine. And after we had built half a dozen mechanical prototypes and just done horrific things to pig intestines that we that we got at the local market. My older brother, who's a lieutenant colonel in the Air Force and a, and a flight surgeon with the 144th, also an ER doc over at Kaiser Oakland, he said, you know what, what if you just drank a bunch of water? Could you swim instead of crawl? And that really helped to crystallize the endiotics of, of today, right? We are a quadcopter submarine pill. It's basically a drone that you control but I'll tell you one thing, I can't wait till we can put two cameras on this thing because, you know, I want to I wanna get stereoscopic vision and, and swim around inside a giant patient's stomach, right? How cool would that be? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Very impressive. And uh, just to also like talk about what the problem space that you're solving is with this device. Right. This is a good point, right? And look, I need to be really honest here. I, I just... Honesty is, is, I think, the basis for, for everything else that follows, right? I'm here because I, I'm convinced that microscopic robot surgeons in swarms will one day tackle brain tumors. And endiotics means the END is to look within or to go within. The DIA, DIA is diagnostics, to understand what's wrong. TX is shorthand for treatment, to actually fix the problem. So I'm, I'm in it for the long haul. I want to build the brain surgery micro robot, but people keep coming back to me and saying, what's your problem? What's your solution? Do you have product market fit? And why should I write you a check? Right. And to be honest, these are really good questions. So I actually have an answer for our humble pill bot, for our moving eyeball in a stomach, which doesn't even yet have surgical tools. The problem we're tackling is that if you ask a, a friend of yours who might have some GI tract issues, could be Crohn's or celiacs, could be GI pain or bleeds, we have more friends in our, in, our, in our personal sphere than we might think that have had to go in and deal with these problems. The, the standard of care usually ends with knocking someone out with sedation and jamming an endoscope into their belly to look around and find the ulcer or the polyp or the, the bleeding, the bleed site or the lesion, right? Usually in some form, we need to jam a tube into your body. And unfortunately, a typical patient will tell you that it's not on their first visit to the hospital. Like my own sister is a nurse. She's a, she has excellent health care, and she came down with savage stomach pain. And I think it's like her fourth visit to the hospital and 
two months in, three months in, she finally gets the endoscopy. Because we need to do some gatekeeping, right? I, I can't knock you out just because you say you have a bellyache, right? If you're vomiting blood, I'm going to do that right away. But for most patients, first, we need to do some gatekeeping because it's expensive. It's risky. Um, we can, besides having issues with sedation, we might actually poke a hole in you or tear you, right? And so first, we're going to try you on a diet. You know, maybe you're eating something that's causing a problem. Then we'll try you on some anti-acid drugs, maybe. Maybe that'll solve a problem. And at the end of that process, you've gotten to the point where it's time for an upper endoscopy. The frustrating thing is that's a 10-minute procedure. Usually a doctor's got their hands on the patient manipulating these tools. 10 to 15 minutes of active visual inspection. So our question, our question to the world the investment community as well. But our question to the world is, this thing cost me 35 bucks to make in my living room. Okay, we could probably make it for 25 bucks in, in some kind of volume. What if I could give a doctor 10, 15, 20 minutes of active real-time inspection in a human stomach over a Zoom call? You know, what if that patient whose belly is aching could eat their dinner, but skip their breakfast, skip coffee, drink some warm water in the morning to sort of rinse out the goo. And like I've done 14 times, drink a couple pints of water at lunchtime, swallow a robot and actively inspect the inside of your stomach visually in real time. And what if we could do that super cheap, right? You know, I, I can show you the predicate for this world, which would be the amazing pill cam. This was developed by a group of Israelis called Given Imaging or GI for short. And Gibbon created, in 1997, the Pill Camera, a passive platform to inspect the GI tract. And the only issue is that, to date, these things have, don't move around, and they, they fell into a bit of an uncanny valley of like a one, maybe, maybe one to three percent use case. Meaning, as cool as pill cams are, they don't do much more, and it's all after the fact. So they're, they're used infrequently. Yeah, not to mention it's a few days, if anything, for it to finally come back through the entire system and you can actually view the video on there. Right, and our goal is just to use that platform as a predicate um, to basically say, hey, let's make a move. Let's start to put tools on them and let's make them super cheap, right? So if, if, if I could build this for 25 bucks, but sell it for the $500 that a pill cam sells for, but save you $15,000 of all this other medical expense, that seems like a huge opportunity, right? I mean, honestly, my goal is whatever a patient or an insurer's end cost is, you know, however many visits that was to the hospital, whatever the sedation and the anesthesiologist cost, whatever med devices were used to support the event, and then finally the endoscope itself, either disposable or, or, or autoclaved or rinsed out and then potentially carrying an infection risk. Whatever that cost was, I wanna do that same job for one-tenth of the cost, either to the patient or to the provider, right? That's, that's, that's the goal. Let's just do it way better, way faster, way cheaper for an appropriate indication for use. Yeah, but it sounds like the, um... Your device is taking what the what that pill bot is, and then adding a lot more features to it, like actuation, like wireless transmission. How are you going to take the prices of that, which is currently five hundred in a very simple system, and then cut it down while adding so much more? Sure. Well, let's uh, let's do that, and then make sure that I, I want to give some credit to a group of Chinese folks, uh, amazing engineers, Onx Robotics, I believe that's how you would call it, with the Navicam product who are actually moving pill cameras around using external magnetic actuation. So pill cameras are starting to move and I wanna give credit where credit is due there. And I'll speak to that in a little bit. $500 is the reimbursement code that the company would get paid, that the OEM would get paid for the product. Their cost of goods is gonna be something below that, right? And then that's how they get you know some amount. Of My goal is to get a cost of goods of 25 bucks and then you know, we'll sell it for whatever is appropriate. But let's distinguish the world of passive pill cameras to the active world of endoscopes where we are actually moving around in real time because the world of pill cameras hasn't yet achieved a billion dollars of 
of like market share per year, right? It's, it's, a, it's a relatively niche use case for passive hill cameras. Whereas the world of endoscopes is actually $67 billion per year. If we look at endoscopes that are slid into the human body, it's this huge market. Now let's, let's cut that down a little bit. Let's look at the GI tract, right? That's about $9 billion. And that's, that's really where we're going to focus. About 50% of that is large intestine, the, the classic colonoscopy. About 25% of it is the stomach with the balance being the esophagus, parts of the duodenum just after the stomach, and then the remainder of the small bowel. So our goal actually is just to go into the stomach and we're actually not competing with pill cameras. We're competing with endoscopes. We're competing with that active procedure that a doctor works on in real time. And if I just said that a Chinese company is doing magnetic actuation of pill cameras, I better give you some differentiation on what we're doing because we're essentially direct competitors with that company who we have tremendous respect for. I want to be very clear with that. The differentiation would be, I want to show you the entire endiotic system. Well, it's PillBot. Each of our little motors cost 40 cents. They're cell phone vibrator motors. Just put a propeller on it. And we need to talk to the robot with a USB dongle. We use a low frequency radio. That's how we communicate through human tissue. This is our system, right? We don't have a, a giant magnetic machine that you've got to lie inside of or on them. And you don't need to be at the hospital to get this procedure. We can overnight this to you. You can pair this over a Zoom call or, or a Zoom-like call. You know, it'll have to be HIPAA compliant. We'll probably have something of a custom platform there. But to use Zoom calls, that's kind of a ubiquitous way to use a video call, right? Or to say video call these days. This is our system. And I want our system to be 25 bucks. And I want our system to be able to function anywhere on or off the planet, right? A refugee camp, you know, like a developing country, maybe a forward deployed military area. You could use it in a hospital and they will get used in hospitals. We'll probably begin this adventure in hospitals. But to sort of prove a point, we recently, while we were working on a mechanical engineering issue, like the buoyancy, the floatability of our capsule, we got in the cockpit of a Cessna 310 over Watsonville, California and clawed our way up to 11,000 feet and pushed the nose into a, a ballistic trajectory, you know, eventually pointing almost straight down um, just to get a couple of seconds of weightlessness, right? Because this platform works even better in outer space, right? So the goal here is to create a hardcore form of telemedicine, initially focusing on what I think is the most appropriate market, probably stomach. And then let's just see how far we can go with it, right? Yeah, so, and then it, it sounds like what you're suggesting is that this does not even really need to be used by a medical professional, at least long-term. <laughs> okay, so short-term, I wanna give a doctor, a gastroenterologist, to be specific, a one-for-one -one replacement of an endoscope for an appropriate indication for use. So let's look at three things a lesion in your stomach, an ulcer, a, a stomach bleed, something like that. These are things that we can look for visually and we will fairly rapidly be able to tell you if that does or does not exist in your stomach. So that's going to be our first stab, right? And this is remotely operated by a doctor. Well, that's the fun part, right? Because right now, the only way for a doctor to perform that examination is to have you on a hospital bed, knocked out, all your clothes off with tubes jammed in every part of your body. And that's, that's a non-trivial moment in time to bring both the doctor and the patient to, right? You can imagine the lot of, a lot of procedures like this were delayed during the time of COVID because, you know, unless you're actively dying, we don't want doctor patient contact. We don't want patients in the hospital that might contract or spread COVID, right? So like you have all these procedures getting delayed, but let's be clear, we're not a COVID company. We just appreciate how COVID has shown light on the value of telemedicine. And so to your, to your point and your question, yes, it's remote, right? We've controlled these over internet protocol already. One of our youngest interns was the one that uh, pulled that off. He's now at Stanford studying cognitive neuroscientists science and, uh, and artificial intelligence. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> right.
but yeah, no, we want to, we want to control these over internet protocol wherever possible. And just, just basically, you know, step a little bit further into that future that we all want. Yeah, no, it's very interesting. And also you touched on earlier about this challenge of raising money for what you're needing, what your business goals are right now and what the current use case is right now versus what some of the larger uh, company visions are in the future. So how has that affected your decisions? Well, I'd love to, I'd love to speak to that a little bit, you know, so, you know, if anyone's listening and you've got an interesting idea, honestly, th this is the first time I, I call myself a, a, a co-founder. It's the first company I've ever named. And we chose a hardware enabled FDA regulated company, which essentially from an investing standpoint is like two very powerful slaps to the face. But anyone who's founding a company needs to be prepared for a fundraising experience that is comparable in difficulty to certain things like getting into Harvard or Yale, right? Like, like I think Harvard has something along the lines of like a 5% acceptance rate. And and yet it's an amazing school from what I'm told, right? It's, it's a worthy challenge to take on, right? And this is why you probably apply to more than one, more than one awesome school. Fundraising for anyone is going to be on average a 1% yes rate, right? Meaning you need to get hundreds of no's before you get a handful of yeses and you close a round of funding, right? And this is something I luckily was prepared for this reality by Founder Institute. They were very clear about how difficult and punishing this, this environment is. But the thing that I appreciate about how difficult fundraising is for everyone is that founding is a place for passionate founders. It's, it's a place for passionate people who believe deeply in to their very core that there's something good in their idea, right? You don't want people founding companies who have some kind of backup plan, right? Because if you have an easy, reasonable backup plan, you, you're probably going to take it when things start to seem hard, right? So I, I have a spreadsheet, you know, it's one of my multiple tabs open that shows something on the order of like 300 frontier health tech venture capital funds that we've pitched and thousands of angel investors that we've pitched. And we've got a handful of yeses. And so fundraising is hard for anyone. Hardware regulation is going to make it a little bit harder, but it also means you get to meet the people active in that space, which is a huge blessing, right? So I never, ever wanted to become an entrepreneur. I, I just wanted to be able to design tiny robots. That job didn't seem to be available. So I realized I had to go make it right. If, if I was trying to design a company for an entrepreneur, it would be, you know, some kind of phone app. Right. But come on, like, this is cool. It even says endiotics on it. That's great. Phones are great. I love and respect what we can do with ones and zeros, but there's a world out there that goes a little deeper, right? I love that we can analyze metadata and learn things that were not apparent to us previous, but I'm actually here for patients who are getting a diagnosis that is a certain death sentence, right? And I'm just trying to say for the, for, for that patient population and for the doctors who treat them, the oncologists, the surgeons, that there is a group of passionate hackers that are trying with every fiber of their being to make a new world of hardware worthy of the world's best software so that together we can go and do something about it, right? Like the first pill camera was swallowed in 1997. It's been 25 years, a quarter of a century. It's time to take the next step. Yeah. And this product is really pushing the frontiers of the actual hardware development too. I mean, if I think about the other very, very small micro robots, I'm thinking uh, very tiny drones and such, but not, not a lot that are operating inside something as wild as a human body. That's warm, wet, acidic, everything. 
Sure, sure. So now's a good time to give some credit, all right, because we really are standing on the shoulders of giants here, right? So first of all, PillCam, Given Imaging, they created the concept of swallowable electronic capsules, right? These are the founding fathers. Recently, our friends over in China are, are, are taking this to the next level and saying, let's make a move actively. But here's where the real differenti differentiation comes in. Capital equipment and where is this procedure performed? Let's give some credit further more to two amazing uh, people who are bridging the worlds of academia and also like advanced founders in their own right. That'd be Dr. Metin Sitti from the Max Planck Institute um, and Pietro Valdastri based in Italy. These guys are doing amazing things with microscopic, truly microscopic moving robots, usually using some form of external magnetic actuation for, for things that, you know, sort of start to approach the size of the head of a pin or even smaller. And then Dr. Dr. Valdastri is doing amazing work um, with, with soft robotics. These, these guys are awesome. Like they've been kind enough to sort of take me under their wing at times. And, you know, I, I really look up to them as like my heroes. If we were to speak to the differentiation that Endiotics is shooting for, the primary one would be to decouple the patient from the hospital visit. I think, and the funny thing, that's not the reason we founded the company. I think that's just something we ended up stumbling over is that we decided we would put all the tech onto the robot itself. And thus, the smaller the robot gets, the more places in the body we'll be able to go. But we will never fundamentally require the patient necessarily to be tied to a hospital visit. And that's, I think, where you start to tap into the kind of thing that Peter Diamandis over at XPRIZE challenges founders to do, which is demonetize, dematerialize, go 10 times faster, better, and cheaper, right? We're not looking for incremental improvements here. We're trying to do a total sea change. Like let's flip this iceberg upside down so that eventually when we get this right, we can start to hear stories from patients and doctors that say, hey, you actually really changed the game here. Like you've done something good. That That's the moment we're waiting for at Endiotics. Yeah, and it, this definitely also sounds like the type of procedures that maybe people would be hesitant to go into the doctor's office to do. In fact, they're probably hesitant to go into the doctor's office at all. So this would make it more likely to have this actually be serviced for somebody or uh, maybe to catch things early. Is that is that part of the business plan? The cheaper we make it, the more accessible we make it, the earlier on average, statistically, we're gonna catch disease, right? And dis disease is an interesting word because it literally means dis-ease. It means the body not in its natural state, right? In our natural state, our body is amazing at maintaining, healing, catching little tiny cancers and, you know, killing them off with the immune system. The body's amazing and the immune system is, that is a deep dive if you, if you want to learn more about the immune system, right? That, that gets much more complicated the more you learn about it. The bottom line is when we let things go uncaught and untreated for long periods of time, you start to run out of options, right? You know, we lost Steve Jobs to pancreatic cancer and pancreatic cancer is such a, such a terrible one because first of all, it's kind of hard to diagnose, you know, it, if I was to try to screen you today for pancreatic cancer, we could do it with a form of endoscopy, right? Maybe a total body MRI, maybe would catch a lump in your pancreas. Another way would be to jam a tube down your throat, down your esophagus, into your stomach, out the base of your stomach through the pyloric valve and into your small bowel, the first segment, we would then go up your bile duct, which empties in at that location and go up through your bile duct until we find the pancreas and maybe do some targeted ultrasound there to look for lumps from, from a close range, right? Or maybe collect some fluid samples. That procedure that I just described is not a procedure you give to 6 billion people every year, <laughs> right? That's, that's, that's not appropriate. At a patient population level, we we can't do that for the standard of care. And so unfortunately, pancreatic cancer gets caught at stage four, right? So my question is, what if you've got a bellyache and 
you fit the bill for PillBot. Maybe you fit the bill for our next product, which we like to call Pill Surgeon. And you swallow one of those bad boys, your doctor drives around your stomach and says, Mr. Smith, do you drink a lot of coffee? Because I'm seeing an interesting little lesion here that kind of makes me think way too much coffee, right? And, 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 and you're like, yeah, got it. And they're like, excellent. I think we know what to do. I'm going to, I'm going to prescribe you this medication. Chill out on this one dietary thing. You're going to be okay. However, while we're here, let me just drive down to the base of your stomach. Could you take another swig of warm water, warm water that triggers a bolus event, the stomach opens up and now we're admitted into the, the duodenum or the duodenum. I'm still, still working on pronunciation. And I'm working with international doctors, so sometimes I get different. Equipment. But here we are in the first segment of the small intestine, and we see the bile duct. The bile duct is just this little hole, and so I just turn to point it, and hey, let's advance our camera up the bile duct on a little flexible stock. That's a pretty reasonable thing to request of a group of Silicon Valley engineers. We can do that. Let's put a phased ultrasound array around that camera. You know, I'd like to call out Dr. Farah Memon, who's working for butterfly networks right now on a, a handheld ultrasound thing because her work at Stanford on swallowable electronic capsules that do ultrasound is amazing. And uh, I want to give some credit to her for that. But the basic idea is we just inspected your stomach and found you had an ulcer, but in five minutes, we can screen you for pancreatic cancer, right? Let's snake this little probe up your bile duct. Let's have a look for visible lesions in the duct itself. And let's, you know, let's zap some ultrasound and see if we see any weird lumps right and then so is this something that can currently happen right now with this product i mean what we're doing is we're trying to create the platform the foundation right let me see if i can get uh let me see i think i owe my local city some uh, utility bills but i'm gonna use this for a uh, check it out so you've got there you go you see the little thrusters you see the electric motors right we're creating a a a platform that can move around in five dimensions, meaning X, Y, Z, and then roll about two more axes. It's a quadcopter. Uh, what would you do with the magic school bus, right? The goal is to start putting surgical tools, needles, let's do drug delivery, tissue sampling, right? Let's just do everything we can until we've got a family of products that are changing Changing patient outcomes at the population level, changing patient expenditures at the population level, expanding access until you can address the wildly disparate patient populations of the world, right? You know, a, a typical American with decent health coverage is going to have one outcome, but there are countries where, you know, in, in the developing world where someone might have to get onto an airplane to fly to an endoscopy clinic. This all changes when you can swallow a pill and if you have an internet connection, let your doctor control it over a phone connection, right? Or let your local doctor control it directly and not even need the internet, right? We want to make sure both options are available. So that's, that's, that's kind of a, that's, that's kind of part of what, what we want to do is just first let's build a moving eyeball in the stomach. I think there's a job to do there. There's a big market to disrupt. So we're very excited from a, medical standpoint, we're also very extended from a, excited from a business standpoint, but then let's just keep going, right? Cause you know, we, we have, we have concept sketches and design work done that, that takes this all the way down to the rice grain size. I'm not sure that this guy is going to be able to push this tech beyond rice grain size. I think at some point, if we can get, if we can make this real, if we can prove to the world that this has tremendous benefit and value to add to our community. If we can get a couple of products to market a few generations and really show that, that it's here and it's not going anywhere, you know, eventually the time's going to come to step out of the way and let other people take over the reins. Right. But in the meantime, we've, we, we may very well have created the regulatory framework for stuff like this to happen. And the framework with which, you know, insurance companies would figure out how to engage this kind of technology. Like, we're happy to do the basic legwork with some humble first products. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and could you hold up the two pieces again? You had uh, the the pill and the the receiver. Yeah, there we go. So the receiver is outside the body, and then that communicates over wireless frequency to the pill itself. So you know, people ask like, you know, are you using Wi-Fi or Bluetooth? 
those are relatively high frequency radio, like very high data. When you're punching through human tissue, which is basically punching through water, higher frequencies tend to get attenuated and sort of, they, they get absorbed by water very efficiently. So what we do is we take a trick from the US Navy and we just start lowering the frequency until those wavelengths start to slip through water much easier. So right now we're operating about 915 megahertz. Uh, right now we operate in the LoRa band, which is sort of a this uh, hacker band available for multi-use. We will definitely tweak the, the frequency a little bit, but bottom line is it around 900 megahertz, you start being able to punch through a couple feet of water and still have enough of a bandwidth that with a little bit of fancy software engineering and firmware and maybe some onboard image processing, the, the Venn diagram starts to have some over. So that, that's kind of where we are right now. And then this is uploading video data over that bandwidth. That's right. And you know, I have a, I have a public YouTube channel where we just put videos of us testing, swallowing our fish tank videos. You can see the, you know, the, the airplane video or, you know, we put the nose down. We're, we're trying to be open with our adventure because look, human lives are in trust here, right? And when we start to treat millions of patients, things get weird, right? And I feel that it's critically important for us to tell the world that, look, we are doing everything we can to try to create something new and awesome and good that helps people and is better than the old way. And we're willing to share our journey as we do it. Because I just want people to know that <laughs> we are fundamentally passionate about this. this. We're here because we've lost family members ourselves. We are not here to profiteer off of your illness. We're actually here to try to make it much cheaper for you, right? And, and I feel like be, by being open about that, you know, that's, that's the beginning of that conversation. And that's a long conversation that, that trust will take years to build. Right. And, and, and could take weeks to destroy. Right. So we're, we're committed to the long haul, but to kind of answer your question, you know, you touched on what kind of video quality. Oh my goodness. If you look at my video quality right now, it's, it's terrible. It's almost like laugh you out of the room. Terrible. When we did our first inhuman test back in June of 2020 on that couch behind me, we had a 48 by 48 grid of grayscale pixels. Right now we're up to 160 by 160 with color. Right now we're pushing about five frames per second, which for anyone that does like online gaming, five FPS is like, you, you'd go insane if you were trying to play an online game with that frame rate, right? Right now we have a basic Huffman compression algorithm going, which just means like a very small amount of compression. We haven't even done like JPEG levels of compression. You can sort of think of us as slinging bitmaps through a very small pipeline of, of bandwidth, but welcome to our everyday world. You know, these are the things that we're chewing on and getting our butts kicked on every day. One of the reasons we're excited to reach out today and share a little bit of the journey is that, you know, we're actually looking for passionate software engineers for people that write embedded firmware in their, in their sleep. You know, we're looking for people that will take an FPGA and get into Verilog or, or one of the other programs and, uh, and, you know, code, code a compression algorithm not using drag and drop modules that someone else programmed, but I want to see someone that says, I can write a JPEG compression algorithm on an FPGA in one tenth of the memory than anyone else. That's going to impress me, right? We're not looking for the person that says, yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll just drag and drop other modules other people have done and hand that to you. And it's like, come on, let's have some self-respect here. Like we need passionate people, people who are just as passionate as we are to make this thing real. And we do swallow these robots ourselves. You know, we're very passionate about this. Is that the onboarding challenge? You know, honestly, early in a company, I'd, I'd say the rules are probably a little bit more flexible. I think like right now we've recently, you know, begun talks. Uh, we believe we have a lead investor for, for our seed round. So we're, we're very excited to move from the angel phase to the venture capital backed phase. We have, we have a few awesome VCs that have backed us, by the way, um, Lantana Biosoft in Mexico. Uh, we flew down and pitched them in Spanish and, uh, and, and made good friends and they put money into our angel round and they want to be a part of our seed round. Loyal VC out of Canada, that that's our second, uh, actually those are our largest investors. And then, you know, another VC going VC scouts put a little bit of money into us, but the rest is mainly about 50% of it is angel investors. But that that's part of the adventure though, is coming up with an idea compelling enough you know, to get you into a room, but then realistic enough to, to, to make writing a check make sense. That, that's not going to be trivial for anyone. Yeah. 
And so earlier you showed the progression of your prototypes where the first one looked something like a shoe sized. Yeah, there it is. It's like a shoe sized prototype. We call it pool bot because you see little propellers in there, right? Yeah, I see them. It's a quadcopter, right? That gives you the ability to go forward and backward to be able to turn or, you know, or pitch up and pitch down. Interestingly enough, we can also rotate on axis really fast using the propulsion, which we think is going to be interesting for tissue excision, right? For, for tissue sampling. That's the fun part is we said we want to move freely in a fluid volume with no qualifications. This isn't a forward backward game. This is, this is like, give me that Oculus. Okay. I'm in the patient, but like, what if you're not the doctor, right? What if you're the patient or what if you're, you know, a family member or someone else? We'll put on some AR goggles and see a glowing hologram of the patient's anatomy inside their body in real time, right? Th this is the stuff that we're going to be unlocking, you know, hopefully over the next 6, 12, 18 months. Um, it's just super exciting. Honestly, I, I, this is the most fun uh, I've ever had working on a project. Oh, yeah. And it's fascinating to talk about. Is there a battery and an IMU in there also? Like, what's happening? Yeah. So, so for those of, I guess most people on a robotics podcast are going to know inertial, inertial sensing, right? Right now we're using an off the shelf coin cell battery. This is a lithium ion battery, rechargeable liquid electrolyte. The reason we're using this right now for our prototypes is mainly just that of all the batteries we could find off the shelf and readily available, this was the only one that in any sense approached the form factor of a pill camera and could handle driving four electric motors at their at their maximum RPM. Like we, we put a very heavy current demand on our battery. Our next step using some of the money we're raising now is to go to a custom battery because for us, we don't need rechargeability and we really don't need to be involved in the world of like growing dendrites and you know, ever like puffing up a, a cell after you've used it too many times or whatever. We only need this thing to work, but work well for 10, 15, 20 minutes. Okay. So our battery chemistry is probably going to be the single use lithium primary cell chemistry, probably a lot like an Energizer E squared lithium battery. I've actually used those in previous medical devices and never had a problem with them. So yeah, off the shelf battery right now it's off the shelf chips, right? So if you look at the if you look at the components that are populating this, this flexor, the cameras from Omnivision, I think that costs like 70 cents. We've got an FPGA, we've got a little CC1310 microcontroller and radio combo. I mean, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a very humble first product, but believe me, and I'll be candid here. Look, I said earlier in the, in the, in in, in our little meeting that, you know, I suffer from imposter syndrome, like anyone else. I am not a PhD. I don't have a degree in electrical engineering, computer engineering. I'm a, I'm a knucklehead, right? I'm a mechanical designer. I used to call myself an aerospace engineer. So who do I think I am trying to found this company? Well, I'll tell you what, when I go up and down Silicon Valley, I see a lot more people, a lot smarter than myself selling ads on the internet or doing sort of not exactly swinging for the fences with the hardware they're they're building or the markets that they're serving right you know i see a lot of reasonable business propositions but the majority of brilliant people i know are trapped with golden handcuffs selling ads on the internet or kind of enabling consumer products that don't really need to exist and it's not my place to judge but i will tell you that i refuse to be ashamed that i am not perfect because i do think that the idea we're working on and the world we can unlock this new standard of care i think that is worthy of sacrifice right so i sort of throw myself onto that fire and i'm hoping that by swallowing these robots ourselves and by slowly winning over the very best doctors in the world, we've got the chief of GI at Mayo Clinic, number one gastroenterologist in the world. I'm answering to him now.
because we asked him to join our board of directors, right? He's my boss, essentially. We are asking people to help us make this real, right? And so we don't want to we don't want to brush that under the rug. I want I want to take my limitations personally and our limitations as a company, and actually wave them around. You know, let's let's put that on our flag and let's wave it around and say, hey, we're not perfect, but we see an opportunity to do things way better. We do have the ability because we're pretty scrappy. We are very creative, and we're committed. We think that what we're holding in our hand right now is a technology demonstrator worthy of luring in the finest minds from Silicon Valley and beyond, from way beyond, right? To do something truly special. You know, that's, to me, that's what endiotics means. To me, that is my sincere hope. It's kind of like my prayer to the intellectual community. Please come help us do something profoundly meaningful, right? That's how I'd like to frame it. And the, the potential impact of this product is it's massive. And the, the mission statement is also, is de definitely very admirable. Well, I'll tell you what, it's founding is never going to be a trivial journey, right? You know, along the way, we now are on our second CTO, who we're incredibly proud to have. Our first CTO, we moved over to the advisory board. Dan Moyer, easily, hands down, one of the most brilliant people I've ever met. He's just convinced he needs to get a PhD over from WPI. So he's back, just joined the PhD program. And uh, before he left, and once we signed the lease agreement, but then my company would rent his house. So we, you know, we're, we're continuing our scrappy, our scrappy journey for now. We decided to tape $2 to the wall because I challenged him to a $1 bet, which is that we're going to IPO Endiotics before he gets that PhD. And that's a, that's a fun challenge between dear friends, right? And that's, that's the kind of commitment we have to this vision is that, look, if we had some awesome exit opportunity that really made sense for, for a lot of different parties, I'm, 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 I'm all for it. That's great. But our, our plan and our path and our dream takes us through Pillbot, through Pill Surgeon, through Microsurgeon, right? It takes us from a garage to a warehouse to the, the Mayo Clinic Cadaver Lab where we have been, and uh, hopefully soon to a, a little building over by our local Costco that we can put endiotics on the front of. From there, it'll go to a bigger building. You know, we're gonna build these here. You know, this is a very small device that, you know, retails for a fairly large amount of money. And so it, it's appropriate to manufacture locally. You know, it's not like an office chair. That wouldn't make a lot of sense, but this does. We are very serious about building this thing and making it real and just, chewing on those difficult moments step by step because, you know, without adversity, nothing really tastes good when you finally have a big win. Mm -hmm. And so right now you're sitting there with a pretty, pretty great prototype in your hands. It's very functional. It actually can be swallowed and it, it actually can demonstrate seemingly the full capabilities of what you need to do. Maybe barring some, okay, video rate and like some software improvements and maybe miniaturizing a bit further, but what are the next steps before you're actually able to drop this on the market and start generating that money and then be able to, to accelerate the business? Well, I can tell you one thing. We think that the physical size, let me, uh, let me go here. Let's see what, uh, got a good zero. Shift over to metric because we're trying to be civilized today. So I'm going to measure this OD right now. So I'm I'm coming on just over 13 millimeters, just about 50 caliber. And uh, if we look at a pill cam, you know, a typical pill camera, you know, that's about 11.3, you know, so we're, we're a little bit fatter than a pill camera. Let me see here. Yeah, it's about 26 millimeters long. We're, we're a little fatter than most pill cameras. We're actually shorter than some of them. So we actually feel that we have an MVP in this form factor if we choose. The reason for that is that you can pill cam arbitrarily small and you will always have a fraction of your patients who refuse to swallow it. You just don't feel comfortable, right? You know, a lot of people have issues with pills. Some people might be a little irked about electronics, which is a reasonable thing. We don't need 100% of people to be able to swallow this. So I don't need to drive it down to one tenth of its size to accomplish that. If half of the people who see this refuse to swallow it, but we create a tool that a doctor can reach for half of the time, that's a 25% use case, which is 25 times the market share of Pillbot based on that uncanny valley it had fallen into. So the fun thing about being a CEO, even if, let's be honest, I'm a lowercase CEO, 
is that I get to choose where the goalpost is, right? And so our goal is not to make the ultimate product, but to make the first product quickly that can actually go do a good job and disrupt a market and fundamentally move the, move the ball forward. So we think that PillBot is gonna be that MVP. So the money we're raising right now helps us make this essentially the same basic size and shape, but work in the ways where this doesn't quite work well enough. I need some optics. I wanna put a fisheye lens. I need some filters. I've got a bunch of optical haze and glare to deal with. I need neutral buoyancy, which we think if we strip the metal out of this case and go with like a polymer case, single use battery, I think that that's, a, that's about the delta we're looking for, right? So the goal is close the money we have on the table, hopefully do that before Christmas, and then go ahead and over the next six to nine months, turn this into a real MVP, turn this into a product that does a job every single time. And that means I don't want a blue screen of death, okay? I want it to pair. I want it to have a reliable connection. I want the optical quality to be decent, and I want it to do what the doctor asked it to do. We're gonna prove that it works using what you call IRB, or Institutional Review Board Trials. This is where you do a handful of patients here and there. Maybe over a few months, it adds up to like 25 patients, something like that. Some inside of the US, maybe some outside of the US. Some healthy distribution. We prove that it works to ourselves using IRB trials, and then we begin the FDA trial. And right now, our regulatory experts are saying they think it's gonna be something on the order of about 100 patients at a couple of clinical sites around the world to, to prove that this thing is ready for the US. So my goal is originally, you know, I, I'm like classic Elon Musk time, right? You know, I, I, I'm way too ambitious and I often see my numbers, my numbers slip. I'm guilty of that. But my goal is to be selling this thing in the US marketplace sometime in 2023, probably, probably close to the end, to be honest. Awesome. Well, Tori, thank you so much for speaking with us today. That was very interesting. It's a real pleasure. And uh, we're so grateful to join this community and, and also be able to learn how to you know, benefit from it ourselves, right? Because the, the people on your podcast are amazing. The stories are amazing. And you know, frankly, we're all fascinated by what's going on. So thank you. And that's all for today. If you would like more information related to this episode and others, simply go to robohub.org forward slash podcast. And if you have feedback, episode ideas, or might be interested in joining the RoboHub podcast family, we're always happy to hear from our listeners. Just email our podcast lead at abate.de.mey at robohub.org. And finally, before we go today, the whole team behind the RoboHub podcast wishes all our listeners around the world a really enjoyable festive season and a great start to the new year. Our next episode will air in about two weeks' time. Until then, goodbye. Goodbye.